Well, as we start our service this afternoon, um, I'd like to I'd like to ask you to play along with me. I'm going to ask you a riddle, and uh, there will be six clues to this riddle. When you think you've got the correct answer, I want you to raise your hand. Uh, of course, I won't be able to see it here on Zoom, but that's okay. So is everyone ready? Let's begin. The riddle is, who am I? I can fly as high as 18,000 feet in the air. I can travel on my own as fast as 15 miles an hour. I go faster up hills than I go down hills. Under the right conditions, I can eat practically any living thing. I can grow exponentially. And I can create my own winds and weather. Well, if you guessed fire at any point, you guessed correctly. Uh, if, uh, if you guessed correctly even before I gave you uh, a clue, then you listened a little too closely to Brother Bruce as he gave you my title. Uh, how many of you knew all the six facts about fire? Aren't these interesting? Did you also know that a fire's winds can be of hurricane force? or that the radiant heat from an extremely hot fire can kill you before the flames or the smoke ever reach you? Well, fire is fascinating. It is all at once a visible chemical reaction, a light show, a source of heat. In one moment, it provides comfort and light for reading, and while latently sitting by is a threat to your own existence. It's a preparer of food, preparer of materials, and of tools. Fire is mesmerizing to look at, providing instant cause for wonder and meditation. It is both a weapon and a shield, a protector, but always a threat. Controlled by man, it is the most important tool on the planet. Uncontrolled, it causes fear and trembling, death and destruction. Indeed, Fire is fascinating. Well, our topic this afternoon is fire goes before him. And this phrase is taken from Psalm 97, verse 3, using the New American Standard Bible, from which all of our scripture citations will be made. The 97th Psalm is a day of the Lord prophecy. Verse 3 reads, fire goes before him and burns up his adversaries round about him. In our discussion this afternoon, we'll try to more fully understand the phrase, fire goes before him. In order to do so, we'll consider the incredible nature of fire, looking at what fire is and exploring its remarkable characteristics. We'll then look at how fire is generally used in the scriptures for literal and symbolic purposes. And finally, we'll look at some of the prophetic applications of fire, review, reviewing some of the familiar scriptural passages that feature fire during the day of the Lord. Well, let's begin with the incredible nature of fire. If you step back and you think about it, what else is like fire? Anything? From observation, we know that fire is a naturally occurring process. Lightning causes wildfires. Early man used fire extensively, and it has been revered down through the ages, so much so that cultures, religions, and paganism have worshipped fire. The philosopher Empedocles in the 400s BC classified fire among earth, air, and water. He named each of these for a Greek god, and these four are, of course, known as the classical elements. As far as we know, fire is unique to our planet. We also know that fire is incredibly useful to man. It cooks our food, it makes it safer to eat. Uh, small furnaces warm our homes and heat our water so that we can live more comfortably, especially here in the northern climates. And we also know that fire is incredibly dangerous. Over the past 150 years or so, Fire has continued to figure prominently in the news. 
In recent years, smoke from large Western and Canadian wildfires have periodically affected our air quality and visibility. While forests, homes, and lives have been lost in large and small fires alike. But what actually is fire? Well, since the chemical properties of fire were only better understood over the past several hundred years, scientists have described fire in terms of the three link components of its chemical makeup, fuel, heat, and oxygen. Scientists and fire specialists today more commonly refer to a fire tetrahedron as shown on this slide to not only describe fire's components, but also the accelerating effect of a fire's uninhibited chain reactions that are caused by heat. Well, fire or combustion then is actually a series of self-perpetuating chemical reactions involving heat, fuel, and oxygen. When a fire starts, a heated fuel combines with oxygen to cause a chemical reaction called rapid oxidation. But because a fire produces its own heat, the chemical reactions become self-perpetuating. The cycle continues as long as there is ample heat, fuel, and oxygen. Beyond heat, the other principal byproducts of a fire are light, water, and carbon dioxide. How does a fire start? It starts when a fuel is heated beyond its flash point, the temperature at which a solid or a liquid turns into a gas. At a fuel's flash point, the heat creates increased vapor pressure, pressure in the fuel, causing the fuel's atoms to break apart and form gases. And these gases include highly reactive, unstable molecules called free radicals, that rapidly combine with the oxygen that's in the air. And because these exothermic or heat producing reactions cause additional chain reactions to occur, more fuel hits its flat point, flash point temperature and thus the fire continues as long as there is fuel and oxygen and enough heat to keep the reaction self-sustaining. Air temperature or outside sources of heat, such as the sun, can increase the rate of combustion and create more reactions. Of course, with more heat, the bigger and more voracious a fire becomes. Hotter air temperatures usually mean bigger and hotter fires, and hot fires can grow exponentially and reach extreme temperatures, even turning wet or hard-to-burn fuel into kindling. Well, let's talk a little bit more about fuel. <clears throat> Fuels are typically based on organic compounds. These are the building blocks for living things. And there are three primary categories of fuels. The first is living things, which would include trees or wood, grasses and leaves. The second are the products of living things such as compost, dung, proteins and fats, fossil fuels like coal, petroleum, gas, natural gas. And then the third category are the building blocks themselves. There are other hydrocarbons, certain metals, and even hydrogen gas. Now scientists believe that most of the organic compounds in commercially produced petroleum products are formed by the decomposition of the remains of living organisms. But until recent technological history, practically all fires on Earth burned a fuel that is or was a living thing. And today, we might now see the occasional lithium battery pack or even a Tesla on fire from time to time. But let's now talk a little bit about the Earth's atmosphere. So the Earth's atmosphere is also uniquely supportive of fire. When compared to the atmospheres of other planets in our solar system, only Earth contains the right combination of gases to support both life and fire. Too little atmospheric pressure like Mercury, too much carbon dioxide like Mars, 
poisonous gases like Venus, these plants don't support biological respiration, which for humans is breathing, and for plants it's respiration. If you didn't have oxygen, like most of the other planets don't have oxygen, well, again, you wouldn't have respiration, and you also wouldn't have fire. If there were significant amounts of flammable hydrogen or methane gas in the atmosphere, like Jupiter, Saturn, or Uranus, or Neptune, well, if fire were possible on these planets, it would be catastrophic. Too much atmospheric pressure like Venus and the gaseous giants, among other things, our lungs and our bodies would be crushed in less than a second. So we see that Earth's atmosphere is just right. Well, our study this afternoon was partly inspired by Brother David Stein, and we very much appreciate his encouragement to consider this subject. Brother David sent me a short film by Michael Denton entitled Firemaker. And Denton points out what might be obvious to you, but nevertheless is still amazing to me. Denton says that our planet is uniquely designed to reap the benefits of fire, that it's even shaped by fire, that Earth fits the exacting conditions that are needed to support the use of fire, including having an atmosphere that supports combustion, biological respiration, and high fire temperatures. The Earth is the right size to support an oxygen-based atmosphere, and it's the right size to prevent large concentrations of hydrogen gas, which of course would be flammable in the air. The earth supports the growth of large woody plants like trees, which are required for the high temperatures that are required to work with metal like iron. And Denton also says that there's only one animal, the human, that can harness fire's power. He has the intelligence and the nervous system to be able to control and think and plan how to prepare for fire and even how to control it to a certain extent. And he has the physical dexterity and the strength and the form to be able to create uh, fires basically by chopping wood and organizing and planning for it. Well, Denton goes on to explain what an earth without fire would be like. And of course, this was very profound for me. He said that without fire, there would be limited human accomplishment, innovation, or development, and that there would be limited ability to harvest Earth's abundant resources. He conversely then says, because of fire, we have metal tools and metallurgy. We're able then to build with steel and, and put massive projects together. We can cook, we can make ceramics and tile. We have printing presses. We have turbines and in in internal combustion engines. We have batteries, TVs, radios, light bulbs, candles, computers, internet, and glassware, something very important to science that allows us to have telescopes and microscopes and understand the world around us. And of course, modern industry is heavily dependent on fire because it's used in the preparation of all the materials for things like medicine and manufacturing. And Denton says that without fire, the extensively collaborative civilization that we enjoy today would not be possible, let alone a very heavily populated earth. I've got another exercise for you. Can you think of one thing that man regularly uses that hasn't been influenced or created as a result of fire? Well, let's put this into perspective. When we step back and consider Earth, we sit in wonder. Earth was made to support man first and foremost. It's got a protective atmosphere and a magnetic shield. It has a wide variety of living things within a diversity of environments and climates. 
It has a history of change that prepared all of these environments, and it has rich materials and metals that have been made accessible by fire. And of course, the earth was made to support fire. It has an ideal oxygen-rich atmosphere. It has an ideal temperature range at the surface, and it has abundant sources of fuel in both the form of life forms and organic compounds. And of course, plants and animals even have fire-ready features, fears, and what scientists would call adaptations. It's clear to me that man is perfectly positioned to be able to take advantage of the earth and fire. This can be no accident. Well, it's no wonder to us then that the author, firefighter, and fire scholar, Stephen Pine, a man passionate about the study of fire and its effects on humanity and vice versa, said, Earth is a uniquely fire planet and humanity a uniquely fire creature. And the ecology of their interactions is both ancient and profound. Well, while fire is a naturally occurring process, man's impact on the earth has changed the intersections of the natural and the unnatural. Civilization has led to interruptions of natural processes and created unnatural ones in their place. The interactions between man and fire have been rapidly evolving over the past 150 years, as man has acted both as the antagonist and the protagonist for both sides of the interaction, the natural and the unnatural. In other words, man's efforts to improve humanity have both caused fires and prevented them in the short term, and in the long term, created bigger fires and other problems in a rapidly changing world. I took this photo of the Frijoles Canyon in Bandelier National Monument in 2017. This was six years after the 2011 Los Conchas fire. The fire devastated the park and it destroyed trees up and down the canyon. In its first 12 hours, the fire burned nearly 43,000 acres. It was started by a tree that fell onto a nearby power line. According to science.org, 85% of wildfires today are caused by humans, and over 95% of fires that threaten homes are caused by humans. Well, in order to prevent the kind of devastation that's shown in this photo, park rangers incorporated significant impact reduction measures into their fire management program to protect the park's many natural and historical assets. While forest fires are devastating, it is usually the severity of the fire that matters most. Fire is a natural process on earth after all. <clears throat> and the new growth that you see in this photo at the bottom of the valley, as well as in this inset photo, show just how resilient and carefully planned God's creation of nature really is. Sometimes the impact of fires on people, though, is more substantial. Worldwide, hundreds of thousands of people die from the effects of fire, mostly smoke inhalation, every year. That's hundreds of thousands of people. The most deadly wildfire in modern U.S. history occurred last year on August 8 uh, in Lahaina, Hawaii. A hundred people perished. The most deadly wildfire in U.S. history of all time occurred on August 8 as well, but it was 152 years earlier in 1871. Does that date ring a bell with any of you? Well, while that's the date of the Great Chicago Fire, where 300 people died, that is not the fire to which I'm referring. Also on August 8th in 1871, several hundred miles north of Chicago in Peshtigo, Wisconsin, a, mass a massive wildfire started that burned over a million and a half acres and may have killed as many as 2,400 people. 23 years later, in 1894, the Great Hinkley Firestorm of Minnesota 
picked up where the massive Peshtigo fire left off. Daniel J. Brown, in his book, Under a Flaming Sky, captures the ferocity of the Hinckley tragedy with survivor stories and firsthand accounts of the fire. It's a fascinating horror story. In just four hours, 250,000 acres of land were burned. If you can believe that. <clears throat> That's an area larger than the size of many suburban counties, although much smaller than the Peshtigo fire. Amazingly, as tragic and, and as sudden as this fire was, less than 500 people died. But both of these fires demonstrated the incredible power of a firestorm in which, reminiscent of biblical imagery, Firebrands, such as flaming pieces of wood and charcoal, descended like hail to the ground. Multiple first-hand accounts of the Hinkley Fire described the sky as rainy fireballs from the size of hand baskets to railroad cars, and speak of spontaneous combustion from the extreme heat of the fire. Interestingly enough, both fires likely started, at least in part, as an unintended consequence of an agricultural land clearing process called slash and burn, one of the oldest soil enhancing farming methods known to man. Hot, dry conditions used the extra fuel and the little fires from slash and burn as if they were gasoline in one hand and a lit match in the other. And these tragic fires were much worse as a result. Well, as a race, we've learned a lot since 1894, but the modern world is still precariously learning lessons from fire. Mankind is only just now fully realizing how important fire management practices are for the safety of forests and for civilization. That fire is a regular part of the natural process on earth and must be allowed to continue in part to prevent and reduce the risk of cataclysmic fires, which seem to be coming, seem to be becoming, at least to me, more inevitable despite man's efforts. Unfortunately, mankind's more educated attempts are not always successful either. Controlled burns in 2022 contributed to New Mexico's largest fire on record. Back in 2011, the Los Conscious Fire was the largest ever in the state. And since then, three other fires in New Mexico have been larger. Well, the lessons learned from Peshtigo, Hinckley, Bandelier, and from other modern fires have taught us that fire is also an excellent preparer for the future. Fire-scorched land leaves behind fertility and opportunity along with short-term danger. If we show uh, a photo um, here on the left-hand side from Mariposa Grove of Yosemite National Park, you'll note that fire completely destroyed the giant sequoia tree on the right and left another one in the background severely scorched. If we show a little more area of the photo towards the ground, <clears throat> note what the forest floor looks like. Those are young giant sequoia trees. Sequoia trees are some of the most fire-ready trees on the planet and can live to ages well over 2,000 years. Fire actually helps them reproduce by melting the fireproof rosin in their cones so that new, se new seeds can sprout. And these trees, like other trees with fire-friendly fire features, demonstrate how fire can destroy the old, but bring hope for the future by preparing the way for the new. To me, this seems to be a grand jubilee picture, removal of the old so that the new can begin. Well, before we transition into the uh, scriptural aspects of our consideration, let's just briefly review what we've covered. First, fire is naturally occurring. 
but mankind is having a profound interaction with fire as civilization progresses. And the collision is something fascinating to watch. We learned, <clears throat> we learned about the chemistry of fire, what fire is and how it works and how very hard to stop it is if fuel is readily available and the temperature is right. We saw that the planet Earth is perfectly situated to support both life and fire, exactly as if it were intended to be this way, which of course we think it was. We didn't mention this, but even Earth's gravity factors into the feasibility of an atmosphere that supports fire and respiration. We remind ourselves of just how much we can attribute to man's ability to harness fire. To, to our civilization, fire is very important. And practically speaking on it, we depend on it for almost everything that we use in a daily, on a daily basis. We've also seen that fire is incredibly dangerous and wildfire seems to be more and more extreme as temperature, temperatures increase. One of the very large, very large fires in Colorado several years ago was only slowed by winter weather. Another one jumped the continental divide with ease. And because fires can be self-sustaining, readily available fuels make fire risk literally greater. Fire is often unpredictable and one of the most powerful forces on the planet. And finally, we saw that while fire can be horrifically destructive, the planet is prepared to recover from fire eventually, and that fire is a prepare for new growth and for new life. That fire is an important symbol in the Bible is without debate. Perhaps man's complex relationship with fire makes it a more meaningful symbol in scripture. Fire is a force to be used for good, but left in careless human hands, or by disobedience putting fire in the hands of a jealous God, it's completely disruptive. When we think of fire in the scriptures, we probably call to mind several different types of images. For many of us, the most resounding image is that of fire as a destroyer. Consider the day of the Lord picture from Zephaniah 3. Therefore, wait ye upon me, saith the Lord, until the day that I rise up to the prey. For my determination is to gather the nations that I may assemble the kingdoms to pour upon them my indignation, even all my fierce anger. For all the earth shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. Jehovah here lays out for us that fire is the ultimate representation of his fierce anger and indignation, so much so that all the earth is devoured. We can be thankful that fire here is but a symbol, a representation of the righteous emotion of God for his people, and that God's intent in using fire as a destroyer is for a good purpose. Continuing on in Zephaniah, for then I re will restore to the peoples a pure language that they may all call on the name of the Lord to serve him with one accord. This idea of a devouring fire is not unique to this prophecy, but used in others as well. Moses even used this metaphor for God's anger when he warned the Israelites to follow God's commands, to remember their covenant with God, and to abstain from making graven images. He said, For the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God, in Deuteronomy 4.24. Understanding the properties and characteristics of fire helps to put the context in warning. If we lived alongside the Israelites after the Exodus, we might have seen the literal consequences that the Israelites faced when they broke God's covenant or disobeyed him. Literal consuming fires. <clears throat> Let's look at how God uses fire as a metaphor to show how he will help clear the wicked inhabitants from the promised land. We read in Deuteronomy 9.3, 
Know therefore today that it is the Lord your God who is crossing over before you as a consuming fire. He will destroy them and he will subdue them before you so that you may drive them out and destroy them quickly, just as the Lord has spoken to you. God's work goes on as preparatory for the young nation of Israel into Canaan, a guarantee of their success so long as they were to obey God and to follow his commands. God also gave Israel explicit commands on how to deal with the conquered cities of Canaan. If there was idol worship or related disobedience, there were to be immediate consequences. The first was to strike all of the inhabitants and their cattle with the sword. And then we continue to read in Deuteronomy 13, 16, and then you shall gather all its booty into the middle of its open square and burn the city and all its booty with fire as a whole burnt offering to the Lord your God. And it shall be a ruin forever. It shall never be rebuilt. The entire city was to be destroyed, and everything was to be offered by fire to the Lord. The fire was to literally consume what was left of the disobedient city so that Israel did not benefit from the wickedness of others. Fire is used to describe destructive force many more times in the scriptures, primarily representing God's destruction of evil. The list on this slide shows but a few of the examples. In some cases, the fire was literal. In other cases, fire was used as a metaphor. And in later scriptures especially, fire was used prophetically. But there's also many other lessons shown, shown through fire as well. Sacrifice and offerings were an important aspect of understanding God's relationship with man. And of course, we know the book of Leviticus and Exodus and really all of the other writings about sacrifice are provided for us in the scriptures. Talk about the offerings and the special blessing that that was provided to the Levites to be able to offer them. We, of course, know of Elijah's circumstance where he called upon God and God answered him with fire, consuming the altar on Mount Carmel. We'd also like to make mention of something very precious to each one of us, that fire is also used to show the progress and development of godly character. These four examples given here have special meaning to the Christian, understanding that difficult experiences and passing through the symbolic fire of trials is what allows the impurities of our old nature to be separated and removed from our new creature. Well, there are many applications and uses of fire in scripture. <clears throat> In all, we think there's about 1,250 times that fire or its related forms are mentioned in the King James. But we want to stay focused here on the destructive aspect, specifically a handful of prophetic applications. The primary focus of Psalms 93 or 97, verse 3, is about the preparatory actions of the Lord as he is establishing his kingdom. One of the more common applications of fire and prophecy is that of anarchy, combining the fierce anger of the Lord God with the picture of chaos of the fiery end, fiery end times. The prophet Isaiah says, Through the wrath of the Lord of hosts is the land darkened, and the people shall be as the fuel of the fire. No man shall spare his brother. Isaiah 9.19 here the people are the fuel. What is to be burned? The reference to no man shall spare his brother is the ultimate picture of anarchy, a time when things will be so fearful, fear-filled, so desperate, that even close relationships will be ripped apart. This is reminiscent of the battles in Scripture where little tiny Israel defeated its enemies because the enemy's fear drove them to attack themselves. 
such as when Gideon's band of 300 defeated the Midianites and the Amalekites, who were numbered as the locusts. Imagine each of these enemies as the fuel of the fire. They were turned into those unstable molecules, if you will, those free radicals that would rapidly engage in battle or oxidate even with their brothers. What appropriate symbolism. We recall that Ezekiel 38 talks of the destruction of Gog and Magog in the final battle. Verse 19 shares God's description of this fury as the fire of his wrath. Verse 22 describes the destruction of Gog and Magog as a vicious hill and firestorm. Perhaps the fire and brimstone seems <clears throat> perhaps the fire and brimstone seems in part similar to the firebrands that rained down on the town of Hinckley, Minnesota in 1894. Utter and absolute chaos. Utter destruction. Well the next verse in Ezekiel 38 and then carrying on in Ezekiel 39, reveal the purpose behind such a fierce blow of God's anger. And I will send fire upon Magog and those who inhabit the coastlands in safety, and they will know that I am the Lord. My holy name I will make known in the midst of my people Israel, and I will not let my holy name be profaned anymore. And the nations will know that I am the Lord, the Holy One in Israel, Ezekiel 39, verses 6 and 7. This will be a revealing element to the people. The revealing of the Lord, his mighty power, and his victory for Israel. Students of the Bible recognize these passages as prophecies that point to the final battle in the day of the Lord, just before the blessings of peace will be poured upon Israel and ultimately upon the whole world. <clears throat> in a world com completely desperate for the Lord God and his righteousness, we see how this is a preparatory fire that in turn has the people on their knees. The fire is a, signifies the complete destruction of the corrupted systems, the governments, the churches, and the institutions that have been used for wickedness. Destruction of the major enemies of God and the barriers to the ushering in of worldwide blessings. We know that the destruction of fire does not end the earth. For why would the people, all the nations, need to know the Lord, as written here in verse 7? A more severe, even, and perhaps comprehensive prophetic picture related to the destruction with fire comes to us in 2 Peter chapter 3. This chapter is a particularly valuable one to Christians as it confirms the Old Testament prophecies of Isaiah 51, 65, and 66. Peter also helps to explain how these prophecies relate to spiritual Israel. Well, we won't do a comprehensive study of this chapter, but please consider this more of an interpretive overview of the new heavens and the new earth prophecy. Let's start with 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 7 and 8. But by his word, present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. But do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like one day. The fire that is prophesied to come upon the presence in present heavens and the present earth will be held back or reserved until this day of judgment, which is here implied to be 1,000 years. Continuing on with verses 9 and 10, the Lord is not slow about his promises, some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, in which the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat, and the earth and its works will be burned up. Note that God's intention for this day 
despite it being one of judgment and antitypical fire, is that all would come to repentance. The same day will come upon the ecclesiastical nominal heavens and governments and systems of the earth destructively with intense noise and heat and burning. And then beautifully comes the message to the church in the flesh who both precede and are present when this great fire comes. Let's read verses 11 to 13. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy con conduct and godliness? Looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with intense heat. But according to his promise, we are looking for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. This, the Lord's day of a thousand years, will at least start with fire and burning up of old symbolic heavens and earth with all their wickedness, unrighteousness, and barriers to the coming new heavens and new earth. This preparatory destructive work of God through his returned son is the fire that goes before him. Well, now I'd like to share my perspective on Psalm 97, the source of our theme text. This is a beautiful psalm about the day of the Lord, a beautiful depiction of the reign of Christ. Verse 1 starts with, the Lord reigns. Jehovah in this prophetic day, now upon us and well begun, is reigning through his risen son. As the Apostle Paul tells us in Ephesians 1.10, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he, God, might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which on, are on the earth, even in him. We continue. The Lord reigns. Let the earth rejoice. Let the many islands be glad. Clouds and thick darkness surround him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. Fire goes before him and burns up his adversaries round about. The chapter open and opens by announcing that the Lord reigns and that all should rejoice. But the clouds and darkness of verse 2 imply that not all yet recognize him and that he is here to restore justice and righteousness. Thus, fire goes before him, destroying his enemies. Destruction of the old, symbolized by fire, is the first act of his new administration and rule. And we know from other scriptures that these enemies are all things of this earth that stand in the way of restoring mankind fully. Verse 4 continues the trouble as the revealing of the Lord and his works cause fear and amazement. His lightnings lit up the world. <clears throat> the earth saw and trembled. Verse 5 shows that the destruction of the mountains, the kingdoms of this world, begin at his presence. At the presence of the Lord of the whole earth. The mountains melted like wax at the presence of the Lord and the presence of the Lord of the whole earth. This connects our concept of the Lord's presence very directly with his reign. He is the Lord of the whole earth. Reading verse 6, the heavens declare his righteousness and all the peoples have seen his glory. This describes that the heavens, the new heavens of 2 Peter 3, the raised and completed church, will declare the next phase of the reign, and the Christ will be fully recognized by the world. <clears throat> Verses 7 to 9 show the work in the hearts of men, as sin and desires incongruous to God are removed, and the new covenant is instituted in Israel, the daughters of Judah, as a pattern for the whole world. Let all those be ashamed who serve graven images, who boast themselves of idols. Worship him, all you gods. 
Zion heard this and was glad, and the daughters of Judah have rejoiced because of your judgments, O Lord, for you are the Lord most high over all the earth. You are exalted far above all gods. The exaltation above all gods, the Lord most high over all the earth, is the recognition by all that the king is reigning and that nothing is interfering with his rule of reconciliation and righteousness. Christ's rule is far better than anything that the inhabitants of the old earth could have ever appreciated and will stand in great contrast to the previous administration of the adversary. Verses 10 to 12 show the progression of the human heart, delivered from sin, evil, and the wicked one. Hate evil, ye who love the Lord, who preserves the soul of his godly ones. He delivers them from the hand of the wicked. Light is sown like seed for the righteous, and gladness for the upright in heart. Be glad in the Lord, you righteous ones, and give thanks to his holy name. We see two applications here, both in alignment with the divine order of righteousness. First, these verses apply throughout the gospel age, to those who have been reckoned to be delivered through their belief in Jesus Christ. And likewise, second, during the latter part of this millennial age, through the process of restoration, the hearts of men will be taught to hate evil. They will recognize and remember their deliverance, and all men will be made righteous with love and justice in their hearts, giving thanks to the Heavenly Father and their King, Christ Jesus, their great deliverer. What a tremendous message of comfort and new growth after the fire of destruction with which our Lord began his reign. In order to fully restore mankind, all the adversaries need to be burned up. The Apostle Paul corroborates this in the resurrection chapter, 1 Corinthians 15, that the age-long work of the reign is the destruction of all the adversaries, all enemies. For he must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be abolished is death. Here the end of the millennial reign is defined as the time when death, Adamic death, will have been defeated as the last enemy of mankind. Fire will take out the big enemies and the work of resurrection, restoration to perfection and the removal of the smallest but deadliest of enemies will mark the completion of this reign. The reign is a work throughout its duration. It will take a thousand years to complete. Brethren, we stand here together in a special place of blessed perspective. Not all are yet able to see the coming glory and happiness of the kingdom. The dark clouds of trouble and fire of destruction are already burning, but soon these prophecies assure us we will see the completed fulfillment of God's glory being revealed to the world. <clears throat> that we take fire for granted is an understatement. It has changed our world and it continues to do so. Without it, we wouldn't be virtually here together sharing this feast over Zoom. It's a gift from the Heavenly Father but it's still not fully controllable by imperfect man. We've considered what makes fire so unique and even how the earth is the perfect place for it to exist. We've looked into fire and why it makes such a great symbol in the scripture, because it destroys evil and unrighteousness, because it's only controllable by God, because it accomplishes his will, because it prepares the world through the tearing down of the old and perfect order the old symbolic earth, because it prepares <clears throat> the world by tearing down of old imperfect religion and the old symbolic heavens. It prepares the Christian through difficult experiences and trials, like the purifying fire of Malachi 3, 2 and 3, which we won't have time to read, but I know is so dear to each one of us in our hearts. Brethren, fire leads the way for the kingdom so that the mediatorial phase of the reign can be set up and the new covenant can be facilitated to and through Israel. It prepares all of us for the new heavens and the new earth, symbolically speaking, of course, wherein dwelleth righteousness. 
<clears throat> Brethren, let's not lose heart for the trouble that we see around us. We are right there. Our warfare is being completed. As we heard in our morning devotions and in Brother Dan's discourse paralleling our Psalm 97 texts, Psalm 50 prophetically reminds us of our covenant of sacrifice, saying, Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty God has shone forth. May our God come and not keep silence. Fire devours before him, and it is very tempestuous around him. He summons the heavens above and the earth to judge his people. Gather my godly ones to me, the saints, those who have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. And the heavens declare his righteousness, for God himself is judge. Well, unlike natural Israel in the wilderness, we do not have to be deathly afraid of our God in his fire. We read from Hebrews 12, verse 18, For you have not come to a mountain that can be touched to, touched and to a blazing fire and to darkness and gloom and whirlwind. Continuing on with verses 12 to 22, or excuse me, in chapter 12, verse 22, we read, but you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant. See to it that you do not refuse him who is speaking. Brethren, the God, God, the judge of all, has brought us to his mountain. Mount Zion, together, a place without fear. Through Jesus, let us approach boldly. Let us hear his voice so that we can do his will. What a blessing that we might be able to declare his righteousness after the fire that goes before him. May the Lord add his blessing and overrule anything that has been said amiss.